Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. I'm Kathy. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm flustered, so I don't know what you're going to... Oh, God, you're taping, too. Um, <laughs> last time I was here, it was the other door, and I went to the other door, and I'm like, they locked me out. <laughs> and then my purse started buzzing, and Jim had sent me a little text message. Go to the door on the right. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm very grateful to be here. Thank you, Steve, for inviting me up. I hate holiday traffic. Um, I, um, I'm your typical run-of-the-mill, average, everyday drunk. I'm uh, puking up, falling down, stinking, ugly alcoholic. Um, and I'm, <laughs> I clean up well, don't I? I, um, I? I absolutely love this program for the life that it's given me. I hear a lot of people say from the podium that... Um, Alcoholics Anonymous gave them back their lives, and um, I don't know that I can say that because I didn't have one to start with. I um, I live in the Baltimore area. I live down in Valley, Maryland. Um, it's about three hours south of here on a good day. <laughs> um, I've lived there for 20 years. You can tell that I didn't grow up there. Um, I'm originally from Boston. I grew up in Boston my whole life there. I love it. I miss it. Um, but I had a real normal life, um, probably very much like all of yours, you know, um, good family, real Ozzy and Harriet kind of household, um, the oldest of three kids, great, great parents, wonderful family. Um, I can't, uh, there, I tell people that all the time because I, I'm trying to point out that there isn't any reason for my alcoholism, you know, I can't, I can't point to anything and say that's what did it, you know. But I know that I was born an alcoholic. I know that I've, I've been an alcoholic since conception. And, and when I was new, I never got when people said that, you know, because you don't come out of the womb with, you know, Johnny Walker in your bottle. I, uh, but I, can, I understand it today, and I can say that today, because if you ask anyone in the real world, you know, um, the definition of alcoholism, um, if you look up on Wikipedia or, or in Webster's Dictionary, the, the definition of alcoholism for the rest of the world is an inability to stop drinking. Um, the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous tells me that my alcoholism means that I suffer from a spiritual malady. And that's how I can say I was born an alcoholic, because I suffered from a spiritual malady from the time I was born. I always felt different. I never felt like anybody else. I never felt liked or loved. I, I never felt like I belonged. I'm the oldest of three kids. I got a younger brother and sister. They grew up in the same house. Neither of them are alcoholic or have any addiction problems, so I know that it was me, you know? Um, it certainly wasn't environmental. It was just my perception. I know that I was loved, that I was wanted and welcome everywhere, but I never felt that way. I always felt different from everyone else. I, um, I was talking to my sponsor the other day, and... Um, we were watching this little kid running around with a toy, and, and, and I had it. And I remember that. I'm like, wow, retro, they're coming back with those. And when I was a little kid, you know, they didn't have, like, Game Boys and Wii and, you know, all that stuff, um, the computer games. Um, I know I'm dating myself, but when I was a kid, you know, we had outside. Our parents just said, go outside, you know, and, that, and that's what we did, you know. And, but um, when I was like about 10 years old, the big toy, the, the big thing that everyone who was anyone had to have was this, it was this, re, ugh, this big plastic ring. I don't even know the name of it. And it had a long string and it had a bell on the end. And you'd put it over your foot and you'd spin it around and you'd jump over it, you know, <laughs> and, and you had to see how high you could get. That was the big thing, how many times you could jump over it without tripping. <laughs> and... <laughs> Everyone had one. Everyone on my street, the girls, the boys, everyone. And they'd go running and skipping and running and cartwheeling. And I mean, they did everything with these things. And I'd sit there and I'd listen to them walk by, you know, and they'd be like, 41, 42, 43, you know. And, and I remember vividly sitting on the curb on the side of the road with my arms crossed, just 
what a bunch of retards. <laughs> you know? I mean, I am just way too cool to run around with the bell on my foot, you know? And I'd sit there and, and I'd watch them all and some of the kids would come over and they'd go, oh, do you want to follow mine? And I'd be like, no, I got one, want it? You know, I was just too cool. But looking back on it now, through the eyes of an adult, um, what it was is I was short and I was fat and I was uncoordinated and I couldn't get past one. And I couldn't bring myself to admit to anyone that I didn't know how to do it. And my ego would not allow me to ask for help. And so I had to make myself better than you and be too cool and sit on the side of the road and suffer in my own silence. And, and little kids don't understand that inferiority, superiority thing that we got going, you know? But a little kid knows when they're different. And, and they just instinctively know that they need to keep it to themselves. And so I did. And I never let anybody know. And I, I became the wonderful, oh my God, I became such an actress. I, um, I developed this ability, you know, um, like we all do, the chameleon thing. I realized at a real early age that, you know, people are attracted to reflections of themselves. People like people who are like them. So I, I became an actress. And I could walk into a room and size you up and I could be you. Uh, so that you would like me. Because I knew if you knew who I really was on the inside that you wouldn't like me because I didn't. And so I just wanted to be anyone else but me. And I had lots of friends. I, um, I can't stand disapproval. Um, and I can't stand for you not to like me. And it's got nothing to do with vanity or popularity. It's just that I can't stand for you not to like me. And um, so I had to make everyone like me. And, and you know, in high school, you got all those different groups, you know, the, the jocks and the geeks and the freaks and the heads. The, they're my favorite. I love the heads. The pot heads, you know. I did. I never liked pot. I, um, I am definitely a true alcoholic. I, um, I, the pot just made me paranoid, you know, and I'm way too paranoid as it is. But um, <laughs> the potheads were so cool, though. <laughs> they, you know, we'd like skip class and we'd be hiding behind the bleachers behind the school, and somebody would yell, you know, the principal's coming, and everybody scatters like rats, you know. <laughs> and, except the heads, they'd just be like far out, you know. <laughs> and I wanted to be just like them. They were so cool. Um, of course, they've been in 10th grade three years, but, you know. Um, but I fit in with all those groups, all of them. I mean, I had to. I couldn't stand for you not to like me. And, and it worked sometimes, but when it stopped working was when people came together, like in a big group. You know, um, we'd be like at a beach party or something where I grew up. Oops, sorry. I do that when I'm nervous. Yell at me or throw something if I do that again. <laughs> Ooh, bugs. <laughs> That's what was bothering me. Um, <laughs> okay, making a hell of an impression here in Chatham. <laughs> it looks like a lightning bug. Um, anyway, I would be like at a beach party or a school dance or something, and, and I'd be with one group of kids, and, and they'd be acting one way, and, and I'd be acting like them. And, and fitting in, and then another group would come up, you know, the heads or somebody, and they were my friends too, and and that's when it would hit me, you know, which mask do you wear, you know, which face do you put on, and um, I lived in fear, I always lived in terror that um, you were going to find me out for the phony that I was, and that scared the hell out of me. I, I remember always being in fear. Um, the big book talks about fear of impending doom, and, and that hit me. You know, the minute I saw it, because I knew that feeling. I'd, I'd always been afraid my whole life. Um, graduated high school, got a killer job, made lots of money, traveled around the country. You know, I started doing all those things that the big book tells us that we do to try and relieve the hole in the soul, you know. Um, I, I had the friends, I had the job, you know, the prestige, the company credit card. Um, I got all the stuff that goes along with that, too. You know, at that time in my life, I saw success in people by the amount of stuff they had. I saw my parents as successful. They had nice stuff. I thought that's what I needed. Bought a house, 
got a really bitching car. I got, you know, everything that you would think would make me happy. And, and I was dying inside. I just couldn't ever belong. I don't remember my first, my first drink. I do remember my first drunk. I was 14 and um, at one of those beach parties that I was talking about. Um, that's where we hung out. You know, you couldn't drive 10 minutes in any direction and that part of Boston and not hit water. So we always hung out at the beach. And I was there with some older cousins of mine. I was 14. They were all 16 and 17, and they all drove. And um, they, they were all drinking. And I thought they were cool. So I decided I was going to get drunk, too. Not have a drink. I could have, you know, walked around with one beer all night, and no one would have known the difference. I made a conscious decision to get drunk. And I did, 14 years old, you know, 90 pounds, soaking wet, and, and I drank a six pack and um, proceeded to black out and then pass out and woke up the next day face down in the sand, you know, covered in puke and flies. And, you know, my cousins had left me there, nice family. Um, <laughs> but I, I remember the way it felt that night, you know, that night when the beer hit me for the first time that moment that we all have our, our love affair, you know, when we find our answer. Um, up till that point, there was so much noise in my head and I could never turn it off. I could never stop it. I was one of those people that could never sleep at night. No matter how physically exhausted I was, I couldn't sleep because I just couldn't stop the noise. And um, I, I use this a lot when I talk. It, 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 it sounded like I was listening to a 24-hour talk radio station over and over and over, and I just couldn't stop the noise. Except that night, when the beer hit me, when I started getting the warm fuzzies, um, it was like some giant hand just turned the dial on the radio just a little bit so that what I was getting was static. And that was what I sought for the next 25 years of my life. It, it wasn't that, I mean, I hear a lot of people from the podium saying that the alcohol made them taller and prettier and more interesting and better dancers and make their acting fall off and all that stuff. And I believe that because I hear that a lot, but that wasn't my experience. I was still short and fat and uncoordinated and covered with acne, but I didn't care. That was the difference. I didn't care what you thought of me anymore. And so that was what I tried to find. And that feeling, that uncomfortable, I don't fit in, fist around your rib cage feeling like you just can't get a full breath. That was how I felt every single day. It followed me through my entire life. Um, <clears throat> I told you I got all the stuff and I did all the traveling and I had the job and the one thing I didn't try was the guy. So I had to try him, you know. And uh, that was how I ended up living in, in Maryland. I was on a business trip to Baltimore, and I walked into a bar, and I knew him. I don't know how I knew him. I knew him when I saw him, though, and I thought, I'm going to marry that guy. And um, I did, six months later. <laughs> um, what a nightmare. Uh, we, we had um, a horrible marriage. We didn't even really know each other. Um, and at first, we just drank, you know, to celebrate our new union, and then, and then we drank, I think, to tolerate each other. And then, and then after that, we just drank. And that was the only thing we had in common. And um, we were pretty miserable. And I knew right away that I'd made a horrible mistake. But remember, I told you I can't stand disapproval. I was so full of self-centered fear, I couldn't bring myself to call my family and tell them I'd made a mistake and I was leaving them. So I decided I was going to make this marriage work, no matter how I could. And um, I did what any good drunk would do, and I had a couple kids. Yeah. Um, brought two more hostages into the situation. And we tortured those children. We were horrible to those kids. Um, I, I don't remember doing the good stuff with my kids. You know, the baking cookies and, you know, singing songs and saying prayers and that kind of stuff. I remember, I remember the bad stuff. I remember sending my kids to school in the clothes that they wore yesterday because that's what they fell asleep in. Um, I remember stuffing oatmeal cookies in my daughter's pockets and calling that breakfast and pushing her on the bus because I figured oatmeal was a breakfast food. Um, I was never there for my kids. 
they were unhappy and I was miserable and, and it was a horrible existence and um, I never ever looked at myself it was him everything was his fault you know he was the alcoholic he drank heavier than I did so I blamed everything on him my unhappiness, the kids' unhappiness, um, the reason we couldn't pay our bills, everything was his fault. I uh, stayed with that man 11 years, and finally, I, enough was enough, and I was going to save my kids. And I moved out, found a little ratty basement apartment, and um, moved my kids, you know, alcoholic luggage, the big hefty bags, throw it in the back of the car, and we were gone. And I thought everything was going to be better. You know, because he was gone. I thought my drinking was going to stop. Um, the money was going to get better. I just thought life was going to get better. And I found um, an apartment complex that was really family friendly, which I thought would be good for the kids. And it was. Um, but another reason that I wanted to live in that complex is because there were a lot of teenage girls and babysitters were plentiful. And um, I thought that my drinking would stop and it just got worse. Now I had no one to be accountable to. I had no one looking over my shoulder or telling me how to spend my money. I could not afford to raise these kids alone. I had no money. Um, but I always had money for cigarettes and booze. You know, it's funny how that always works, you know? But I found myself doing really loathsome, horrible things. You know, I, um, there were these women in the building and they were so nice to me, and um, they were moms too, and they would, you know, invite me over for like coffee, and and we'd cook coupons on Sunday mornings, and and they made me their friend. They entrusted me with things that you only entrust with a friend, and I let them believe that I was their friend, but the reality was that I really didn't like these women, and I didn't want to be their friend, um, but I knew that if they thought I was a friend of the family, they wouldn't let the kid charge me to babysit. And I had better things to do with my money. And that's what I was turning into. That's who I had become, and I wasn't raised that way. And I had always disliked myself, but now I'd gotten to a point where I just absolutely loathed and detested myself, and I was drinking every single night. And so my kids went from, you know, drunk and miserable mom to absent mom. Other people were raising their kids. I uh, finally got arrested, and, um, you know, the inevitable happened. I got caught, got a DUI. I drank drunk all the time. I don't know how I made it without getting arrested before that. But um, that night was my wake-up call, and that's what brought me here. And I used to think that was the worst night of my life, and um, that was the beginning of my life. That was the beginning of my living. I um, came home from jail, and... And I knew that there was something definitely wrong with me. Then let me go on my own recognizance, go figure. You know, I blew like a .18 or something, I don't know. But um, I had been in a blackout for like four and a half hours and, and didn't know where I had been or what had been happening. But the reason that was the wake-up call is because I've been a blackout drinker every time I drink. I always black out. I black out and then I pass out. But then I always wake up. And when I wake up out of the blackout, I'm someplace safe. I'm at home. I'm in my car. I'm at a friend's house on a couch. I'm always waking up out of the blackout. This night, when I came out of the blackout, even though I was still very drunk, I was very aware of the fact that I was conscious, that I had been conscious the whole time, talking to these two guys. You know, you come out of a blackout and you're handcuffed to a chair in the state police barracks being interrogated by two troopers, and I had no idea what I was saying to that. <laughs> And, and something deep down inside where only I lived knew that that was just not normal. Something's wrong here. So I um, came home from jail, and, and sitting there on the coffee table was the phone book. Now, I don't remember putting it there, but it was there, and I just flipped it over to the yellow pages. And thank God our name is easy. You know, it's right under A. And, um, and I called, and they sent me to a meeting. And that was, that was the start of my recovery. I thought that my life was over. I thought I was never going to have fun anymore. I didn't know what you people could do for me. I wasn't really sure I wanted what you wanted. I just wanted to stop hurting, you know? I just wanted the pain to stop. And um, I had serious trust issues. I wouldn't talk to any of you. 
first of all, y'all wanted to hug me. <laughs> you know, and holding hands and praying, what is that crap, you know? But um, I would bolt out of there. I, I, I thought that the only reason that any of you would be nice to me is because you wanted something from me, because that's how I saw you, what I could get from you. If you didn't have anything that I wanted, then I was done with you. <laughs> um, but there were these three old guys that sat in the back, I love that only one of them is alive today. The other two have passed away. They're like 100 years old each. <laughs> um, and they had about 100 years of sobriety combined, you know. And I figured these old guys, you know, I didn't have anything they wanted. So I thought I was safe with them and I trusted them. And I always sat with them. And they, and they were mean to me. They said some horrible things to me. Um, but God bless them. They told me what I needed to hear and not what I wanted to hear, you know. And, and they saved my life, those three guys. Um, it was about six months. I was six months sober and not doing anything except showing up for meetings. And one of them sat me down after a meeting and said, Honey, sit your butt down. Only he didn't say butt. He was very colorful. He said, Sit your butt down and um, we're going to talk. And I want you to tell me about the first step. And I thought, Oh, dear God, here we go. And I said, Okay, I get the first step. Um, we admitted we're powerless over alcohol, then our lives have become unmanageable because we drink. And he said, you added a few words there. It ain't broken, don't fix it, say it again. So I said, okay. I said, well, we admitted we're powerless over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable because we drink. And um, he said, you're, you're missing the whole point of this step. He said, you got the admitted we're powerless over alcohol part. So there's a hyphen in that sentence, and whenever there's a hyphen in this, it means that there's two separate statements. He got the first part. You're an alcoholic. You're powerless over alcohol. If you put even an ounce of alcohol into your system at that point, you cease to be in control. The alcohol controls you. You got that. You can never drink again. What you're missing is the second part. Your life has become unmanageable. You're assuming that your life has become unmanageable because you drink. And you got it backwards. You drink because your life is unmanageable. And I just kind of looked at him for a minute like he was medicated or something. Because, you know, <laughs> I'm not getting this, you know. And he said, how much time do you have? And I was all proud of myself. I just picked up my six-month chip. And he said, that's awesome. He said, if your only problem was alcohol, then by now your life ought to be just PG. And it wasn't. I hurt worse then than I did the first day I walked in because he's taken away my answer. You know, the alcohol was never the problem. The alcohol was always my solution. I, I drank because I didn't want to feel. And when I realized that I was suffering worse now, and I had been sober for six months, I thought maybe this guy knows who he's talking about. Um, and we, we were going to keep going with the second and the third steps, but See, they had the G-O-D word in them, you know, and, I, and don't talk to me about God. I'm not going to talk about God. Um, I'm one of these people that I come in and I sit and I listen to you drunk a log and I laugh when I'm supposed to, you know, but if somebody talks about God and I'm off doing a grocery list in my head. I just, you know, I, I was raised in, in Boston. I'm Irish Catholic. I, I went to church. I went to CCD. I went to Sunday school. I know all the saints. I know all the holy days of obligation. And I've always believed in God, you know, always. I've never doubted that God was up there. I've seen him working in your lives, not mine, but I knew he was there. I never doubted God. But the second step says that we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. I've always believed in God. I've always been nuts. So please explain that to me. And they tried. And I'm sure that they did a very good job of explaining it. They told me that you know, my problem wasn't that I didn't believe. My problem was that I had no faith. And they're two very different things. And, and, I, and the truth is I wanted faith. I wanted faith. And, and I really wanted God in my life. But at that time in my life, I had what I thought were bigger problems. And I couldn't focus on my program. I had to focus on these issues. I know now that there's nothing that important or more important than my program. But... At that time, I thought that um, this was. I, I was having serious money issues. I told you I was raising my kids alone. I wasn't getting any child support. 
because we hadn't been to court yet and the judge hadn't told him to give me any money. So his lawyer told him, well, don't pay anything until you're told to. Um, I had to pay all kinds of court costs and DMV fines um, because of the DUI. My car insurance had quadrupled uh, because of the DUI. I had... <laughs> I had to pay to fix the stupid thing because I had let my car insurance lapse, you know. Um, I, I, it was a nightmare. I had all this money going out. And plus, I'm paying two lawyers. I got a divorce attorney and a defense attorney because <laughs> they don't, you know, they specialize now, you know. Um, so I've got all this money going out and nothing coming in except my tiny little paycheck. And, um, and, and the truth is, I couldn't afford to feed my kids. I was having these little kids live off of ramen noodles and mac and cheese. Uh, it was terrible. But that was just, that stuff was on the side. The big thing that was keeping me up at night was the fact that um, Christmas was in just three weeks and my kids were six and seven and they still believed. And I knew that I couldn't afford a tree, let alone put anything under it. And for the first time in my life, I was starting to see that I wasn't the only one that I hurt with my drinking. That I had ruined these two beautiful kids' lives and, and I was destroying it yet again. I didn't know how to tell them Singer wasn't coming. And it was killing me. And I went to m one of my meetings one night and I sat with my little old dudes, you know, and the one that looks like Popeye came over to me and, and I'm bawling and he's like, what's wrong? You know, and, and so I just like, vomited everything up and told him everything and, and I'm crying and um, he just looked at me and he says honey did you pray about it pray about it that's what I need to do pray about it right you know I need cash I need lots of money do you know anyone that can hook me up get me a sponsor with a lot of money and um, he said honey mortal man cannot perform miracles only God can do that and I suggest you hit your knees and I said, you know where I am with my step work. I, I don't even know that he's listening. And he said, God doesn't care what you believe. God believes in you. So I suggest you go home and hit your knees. And I didn't have any other recourse, so I did. And, um, and I didn't really know how to pray, because all I knew were those prayers from my childhood, you know. So I just said the first thing that came to my head, and that was, God, please spare my kids. And I said that prayer over and over and over. Just, God, please spare my kids. They don't deserve this. And nothing happened for about 10 days. And um, I was ready to, like, open a vein at this point. And I pulled into work one morning. It was about 7.30. I opened the place. And um, there were three cars in the parking lot, and they were not employed cars. And I thought, at first I thought I was going to get mugged, but, you know, I don't have anything to take. So I got out, and... Um, the doors opened and these three women came out and two of them I didn't know but um, one I vaguely recognized I'd seen her in the rooms and uh, she said introduced the other two as her mother and her sister and she said could you come over to our cars for a minute we'd like to show you something and their cars were loaded their cars were packed they, they had stuff from the floorboards up to the roof rack I mean all three cars were stuffed and they had games and toys and puzzles and stuffed animals. They bought my kids ski pockets and snow pants and boots and mittens. They, and they gave me a little envelope with some cash inside so that I could buy a tree. And, and I didn't know what to say. What do you say to somebody like that, you know, that does something like that for you? And uh, I tried to thank her, and I hugged her, and she said, no, you can't thank me. And I'm like, oh, oh, yes, you have no idea what this means to me. And she said, no, she said, I do. She said, you can't thank me because I was once in your shoes, and this was done for me. So then I tried to tell her that I was going to pay her back. It might take me 20 years, but I'm going to pay you back every red cent. And she said, no, 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 no. She said, honey, you haven't been around long enough. You don't get how it works. She said, the NAA, we don't pay it back. We pay it forward. She said, you keep doing your step up, and you keep living this program, and one day the ninth step promises will come true for you too. And 
when you're ready and when you're in a good position financially, you got to put someone in your path the way he gave you to me. And then it'll be your turn to pay it forward. And I just spent the rest of that day in awe. Absolute awe. Because two things had happened. You know, one, my faith in humanity had been restored. But two, my faith in God had been restored. You know, I knew who those three women were. They were the answer to a drunk's prayer. I didn't ask for a damn thing for myself. But I asked him to spare my kids, and he did. And uh, I'll tell you, there was nothing under that tree for me that Christmas, nothing with my name on it. And I was the richest woman in the world, just looking at the faces of those kids. And after that Christmas, I dove into my program. You know, I mean, feet first. Um, one, if I'm completely honest, one reason I did is because I asked God for a miracle and he gave it to me. And I was kind of afraid to piss him off. <laughs> <laughs> The second reason is because I knew you guys had something. I didn't know what it was, but I missed it, whatever it was, and I wanted it. And so I just started following you around, you crazy people, piling people into minivans, and, you know, it was like cars at the circus, you know, like 800 people got piling out. <laughs> and uh, I got a real sponsor. Um, and I knew nothing about that woman except that I saw her at every meeting I went to, and she was always happy. And I didn't know happy when I wanted that. And she was awesome. She didn't give me orders. She didn't tell me what to do. She just said, come with me and do what I do. And I followed her like my life depended on it because it did. And um, I slowly started getting this thing. And we started working through the steps. And... Um, you know, four and five were beautiful because I, I learned from talking to her that I really wasn't as horrible as I thought I was all those years. I wasn't really the wretched person that I thought I was. Um, and that, you know, there were other people that had done the same thing. So, you know, um, but the bigger thing that I learned was that I was at the core of everything. That every resentment I had, you know, every grudge I ever held, I caused, and um, that wasn't a pretty thing to look at, but it was very eye-opening when I, when I saw that I wasn't a victim. I'd been a victim my whole life, you know, and, and now I had no one else to blame, <laughs> you know, it was me. Um, but it was funny, nobody ever told me that life would get perfect, but they told me that life would get better, and it did, and it has, every day since. I always leave a meeting feeling better than I did when I came in. Always. And I don't know if it's the message that I hear or if it's being around my people, my family, that are just like me, that understand me and don't judge me and don't look down on me, or, or whether it's all of that. But I always leave better, feeling better than I did when I came in. And slowly life got better. And really nothing changed. I was still working at the same job and driving the same horrible car and, you know, living in the same ratty apartment. Um, but it was me that changed. You know, life got good because my perception changed. And I started enjoying my life. And, and the weirdest things started happening. People started asking me to, like, speak at meetings. And then, you know, like, anyone wants to hear what I have to say. And then this girl out of the blue grabs me after a meeting and asks me if I'd sponsor her. And I said... I don't know. And I ran to my sponsor because I was afraid I was going to kill him, you know? <laughs> my sponsor was like, you don't have that much power. You can't, you can't kill her. Um, but I did with her what I'd been shown. I just said, come with me and follow me. And I dragged her around. And I introduced her to everyone, and I got her involved. Um, my home group made me their speaker seeker. And I loved the job so much, I kept it for a year and a half until they told me I had to give it up. <laughs> but I loved it because it forced me to go to lots of meetings so that I could get lots of speakers and I met lots of people. And I felt like I was in the middle of AA, not just sitting in a meeting. You know, I felt like I was a part of and I belonged. And um, I love our family. I absolutely love it. I can go anywhere in the country and walk into any AA meeting and I'm with my family. It's a, it's a beautiful, oh jeez, I'm running over.
Can I tell it? It takes five minutes. I just got to tell you the back end of this. This is the greatest gift that I've been given in AA, and I've been given many gifts that I so do not deserve, but um, why God gave this to me, I guess so that I could share it with others. But um, on a Friday night, I, I'll never forget this night, I ran into a meeting, I was late tonight, you know, and I come running in with my coffee cup, and I sit down next to a buddy of mine, and, and, I'm, and I'm looking around the meeting, and I'm like taking inventory, who's there, who's not, you know, I go, oh, hi, got your hair cut, cute, you know. and. Um, I check around the room, and I'm waving at everybody, and I look, and a couple of seats over, there's this girl sitting there, and I love this girl. I don't know her real well, but I see her at every meeting, and I always talk to her, and she's always happy, and she's always bubbly and upbeat, and um, she's got about three or four months of sobriety. She's one of those people that really got this thing, you know, and she's just on fire for the program. But this night, I looked over at her, and I almost didn't recognize her. She was, she was a train wreck. And I'm like, leaning over to my buddy, like, what's going on over here? Should I go over there? Or do I need to help her, you know? And he said, yeah, you really need to. He said, um, I don't think you can help, but you need to talk to her. She's got to talk to someone. Well, what is it? Is it a guy? She relapsed. What's up? And I don't know, no, nothing like that. He said, uh, she's a single mom. She's got a couple of young kids, and she's broke. She can't feed her kids. we got a collection going. We're trying to get some food in our house, feed those kids. And he said, you want to kick in? And I'm like, Oh, I have so been there, you know. So I pull up my purse, you know, and I'm and I'm a wicked debit card person. So I'm like scrounging through the purse, looking for change or anything that I've got. And and while I'm doing this, he's still yakking, you know, typical drunks, you know. Meeting going on, we got our own meeting going on, and he's talking, and I'm empty in the purse, looking for change, and and that's when I heard him say it. He said, "But that's not what's really killing her." What's tearing her apart is the Christmas is in just a couple of weeks. And my heart was in my throat. And I didn't hear the rest of the meeting. Because I knew it was my turn. And um, I gave him whatever money I had. And he said to me, do you know anyone? Do you know anyone we can hook her up with, like through your church or something? get her on a donation list or something and I said as a matter of fact I do and you take care of the food I get the other thing covered and um, and I never did talk to her he must have thought I was such a bitch I just ran out you know but the target was open and I had a credit card and I had to go burn up some money and and I went and I bought everything for her that had been bought for my kids you know toys and books and puzzles and stuffed animals and games and you know, pockets and ski pants and boots. And I, my car, I had the trunk, the back seat, the front seat. I could hardly see to drive. And I made about 100 phone calls that night, and I finally found out where she lived. And I went over to her apartment and knocked on the door um, the next morning. And I called her out. And I said, can you come and look at my car? And she's just looking at me. And she's a chore. And she came out, and she's looking at the car. And she's looking at me and smiling, and she's looking at the car, and she's looking at me and smiling. She didn't get it. I'm such a bitch, I didn't tell her. I just waited, you know. <laughs> but uh, it finally hit her, and, and, and it ran her over like a truck, and she just started sobbing. And um, she tried to thank me, and I said, no, you can't thank me. You know, that's, that's not how we do this. I said, this was once done for me. And... Uh, and she said, well, I'm going to pay you back. She wanted to clean my house. She wanted to do my laundry. And, so, and I'm like, no, that's not how it works. And um, I told her what had been told to me four years before. And I said, you keep doing your steps. I'm working your program. And one day the nine step promises will come true for you. And when they do, God will put someone in front of you that um, it'll be your turn and you can pay it forward. And she cried, and, and then we laughed, and we got all the stuff in the house, and we wished each other Merry Christmas. And then I was driving home, and, and this is the gift. This is the gift I got. You know, I was driving home, and I was thinking about her, and I was thinking about what was going through her head, because I know, because I'd been in her shoes. And um, I know that she thought that she got the gift that night. But the truth is that now, being on the other side, I knew what those three women knew four years before, that, that I was the one that got the gift, that the gift is in the giving, not in the receiving, that 
that's our job. It's just to take care of each other. That's all God wants from us. It's just to look after the rest of his kids. I haven't thought about a drink in over eight years. And you'll notice I didn't sing a whole lot about alcohol. The problem wasn't ever the alcohol, it was me. And and because of you beautiful people and this beautiful program that we live, I have a solution to it. And I don't have to turn to alcohol or drugs to to quiet my thoughts and my feelings. You know, I've got a reason to live, and I love my life. Thank you so much for letting me share. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.